10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. Good luck, Stevia. 489. You won't find a cast of characters like this everywhere. Hello, please. I mean, I'll, I'll go anywhere for a potato. Delicious. This particular episode of The Shy Life is, is a little more abstract than usual. Okay, it looks like the hairy guy is ready to record. Three, two, one. Go Shy Yeti. Oh, I hope he hasn't found out my secret. I think he has. Hello and welcome to yet another episode of the Shy Life Podcast with me, Paul the Shy Yeti. How are you doing? I'm all right. Um, I've got Nick here with me again today. Hello. <laughs> anyway, what are we going to talk about this time? Well, we're going to talk about, well, long before podcasts, uh, there, were, there were tape scenes. And, um, and Nick and some of our gang uh, were responsible for a particular one called Rafe Shift. And when we come yep. back after the music, we're going to tell you all about that. Run that theme music. Okay, we are recording. <laughs> it's time for my old buddy, old pal from across the channel, across the pond, Paul Chandler, the shy yeti. He's not that shy. Oh, it's the shy yeti podcast. Yeah. All I wanted was a pie, and then I hatched out of an egg. Okay, bring the mic over. He's ready to record. It's the quiet ones you've got to watch, you know. Is it metaphorical? Is it is it deep? Is it deep? Oh boy, he's not all that shy and bright. Sheesh. me, Governor. It's the Shy Life Podcast. If you thought that was bad, just listen to this. Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait to begin. It's the Shy Life Podcast. He's positively glowing. It's all gooey and meaty. Yum, 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 yum. <laughs> And we're back. Um, so, Nick, um, Hello. You, you, what made you want to do a tape scene in the first place? Oh, well, um, it, my ambition to do a kind of fanzine, because a tape scene is a kind of fanzine, mm. goes right back nearly 10 years before RPS, because uh, we, I joined the Doctor Who Appreciation Society in 1980, and was introduced to the concept of a fanzine, that is to say an amateur-produced fan magazine. And I ordered some in 1980 and 81 uh, and so on. And and I I thought, yeah, I'd really like to have a voice and opinion and kind of do a, do a kind of thing, put it together. And I started one called Megazine in 1981, and it was very basic and very primitive and very crap. <laughs> and I also did, I was thinking of doing one about 1985 or 6 called The Quants and Grig, named after Shocker, the Quants and Grig from The Two Doctors, that sort of cannibal character from The Two Doctors, because uh, I just like the name. I think that's basically what. Uh, but and then in 1983, David Howe, who's very known, well known to Doctor Who fans as, uh, as an author of books like The Target Book and things like that, he produced a tape and i've always loved tapes and i've loved recording that's why i'm doing this now i just love recording and i i thought what a brilliant idea so i ordered it and um and it was a tape the very first tape scene in 1983 and it was a brilliant idea and had clips and stories i'd not heard of and 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 it was it was great and i ordered a unit tape scene and then sonic waves which was the following year which was done by our friend alan uh, which kind of took it to the next level. It was ni- quite nice, t- technical, really good quality articles. Keith was, our friend Keith was very taken with the tape scene. He he produced one called Megloss for a few bit, for a few years. I was struggling to think, I really, 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 really want to do something with this. And, uh, I, and, and around about 1989, it all came together because I, 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 the other one I did try was one called Ergon, which I, I just had, the last few seasons of Doctor Who and I just did a season review and then had an interview with the cat 
um, who wouldn't talk to me. So I, that was a complete damn squid as well. Um, around about 88, Warren Langdown and I were thinking of doing um, a, some kind of a zine. And I, we were thinking of trying to think of a name. And I suppose Ray Face Shift has always stuck in my mind. It's a bit of jiggery pokery uh, jargon that was uh, given by the Valyard at the last episode of Trial of a Time Lord. And it stuck in my mind because my tape ran out just before that bit. And my friend Joe Bunsell did me a copy of the whole episode. And that was the first new bit I caught on to. It trips off the tongue. I've always liked, liked it. And uh, I suggested that to Warren and he kind of threw it out. And we never got on. And then when we did... Um, uh, well, uh, the following year, I started getting more stories on tape. And I rather bought the rather important acquisition of a jack lead, which went straight into the video and straight into the recorder. And I thought... Uh, yeah, we we were on the go, and it was your good self that pushed me, kind of gave me the final push, really, for to do RPS because um, you did a, a one. I I don't think it was oh, what was it? It was a tape, a prototype tape scene, and you did a Doctor Who story, and which you enacted all the parts yourself, and you did a review of State of Decay, and um, I I thought right. That is really got to be it. I, I have got to do this because, you know, all my friends are doing one. So I went for a face shift in the summer of 89 and I did some articles. I think I did a, a, a look at the Robert Sloman stories. I had some convention uh, audio stuff that I could put on there just to sort of break it up a bit. And I did the first issue and, and that was... You know, I, I distributed it to you and to Fred, you know, all the, I, I think it was only myself and Andrew Candish on the first issue because I, I wanted to put it out in such a hurry because, um, and I think you were still at school, so I didn't know, I'd probably see you at half term or something like that. And um, season 26 was coming up, so there was a sort of, I think it was, bef I, it went out, I think I finally, 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 finally finished it about half term. So season 26 had only got halfway through by the time it, RPS came out. Now, I wasn't... I, I thought this was a pilot. You know, kind of... I'd done one off. I just wanted to get out of my system. I really just wanted to do this. And then Warren said to me, so, when is RPS 2 coming out? Oh. Oh. Uh, uh, well, I mean... And I, I, I went to Andrew Candish and approached him for a Power of Kroll review. And, um, and we kind of got it up. And then I started Double Duds. Well, I kept Double Duds, which was an issue where, where I looked at two stories that, of Doctor Who that were, were not very well considered. And that, that ran and ran and ran, that article. I, I could still do it today because there's just so many stories that are still neglected. Um, and that was it, really. I mean, we, we, we went from strength to strength. And, but, yeah, that's, uh, it, it, was a, it was a very, very long winded desire to to do a fanzine uh, and then pr subsequently a tape zine yeah, i think that might be how it happens certainly how it happened with with this podcast that when i decided i was going to do it i went and recorded a pilot pretty much in one day just wandered off uh, I, I i kind of decided i think the original um like introduction stuff was was done out out and about because that was one of my premises that i wanted it to be not just not just sort of indoors if right. it could go outside then it would and i wouldn't did and then i think around the same time i was seeing my old my old school friend paul so i got him to be the first guest yeah. we, were, we were going for a little a little walk i'd stop and sort of say well what are your memories of primary school and what's and, and and he's a good he can he always talked very sort of um because i suppose when i was doing my things it was it was there wasn't one subject so it was difficult to quite know what <laughs> I did. Well, um but but i think when you do do these things sometimes the best thing to do is just get on with it and and absolutely and and that that is exactly what I learned with RBS because you know I thought to myself well Paul was doing Meglos no sorry Keith was doing Meglos you were doing your your um, was it was, um, was that and I just saw everything you, was that yeah well I think that was that was one that was mooted but this was an just a one-off Doctor Who one mm, in I the summer do. of eighty yeah. nine uh, there was a, there was definitely a home produced story yeah uh, with set in the I, I think it was early Baker years because I think the giant robot made an appearance and sort of taunted Sarah Jane. 
Uh, that's all I remember about that story. But um, mm-hmm. there was also a state of decay review. I remember and- doing. Yeah, I remember doing that because um, I suppose what, what what I should say around, around this time is is that I I had done a little bit of writing for a couple of amateur um, fanzines um, around that sort of time because around that time we were getting pen friends and um what one of my one of mine was an andrew and um well andrew reed not andrew candish andrew reed who um was involved with a, a, ta- a, a fanzine called revelations and i wrote some stories for them but i kind of lost a bit of interest in doing that because i was i think i was i did a john poetry story and they said it was was too too John Pertwee ish. It wasn't that I was nicking ideas from anything. It was just that I was. Well, well that was Andrew. That's Andrew's a bit weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it wasn't him who said it. It was the original editor who said it. Was the original editor oh, who said, said that? Um, um, but yeah, sort of. Yeah, sort of. Um, yeah, it's. it's I, think so- I, was, I think I was around that time when I stopped writing Doctor Who stuff and wrote started writing more of my own characters yeah it's a lot more sad that that i suppose is ultimately <laughs> fast forwarding to the end of the act and, and that's sort of why i gave up uh, rps because i'd done i wanted one of the sub texts of rps was to stand up for what and doctor who had been Un, dri, uh, driven underfoot, you know the, the the supposedly bad story, the supposedly bad companion, the supposedly bad effect, um, and the show was in a place where everyone was bashing it um, with the Sylvester and 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 I I really felt because uh, for year that one of the things that drove me was for years in um Dwarves, I felt I didn't have a voice you know and no, uh, only one person ever printed an article I wrote and I got the feeling that you know a lot of the fans were a bit slightly older than me and very cynical and very kind of public school about um the whole thing about you know sort of uh the Graham Williams years for example I mean I was a great advocate for that because they got me out although I liked the Hinchcliffe years the Philip Hinchcliffe years like uh, the Graham Williams got me out out of the sofa watching the show loving the show and I felt I really owed a huge debt to to it and uh, I, I regularly I did a Graham Williams special when the poor fellow died and um, I, I was very keen to stick up for the underdog. And I felt when we finished up in 96 that the face of fandom had changed. They, it was a lot more Williams friendly and people were a lot more... Doctor Who magazine was a lot... Ha- in a, for, for me, it was in a happier place because I think Gary Gillett was, I thought, super editor i don't uh, yeah i don't know what the editors are like these days because i don't really buy it anymore but um he was very open-minded about stuff and i liked him very much and uh, his style i remember writing into dwb which is different which is originally doctor who but then moved into all sorts of sci-fi i remember writing to them and and so, so when i bought my first copy sort of saying i enjoyed reading this magazine but i i, I wish there wasn't so much negative stuff about yeah. the current Doctor Who because I really like it and, and yeah. they printed my letter but they all they included was I really enjoyed reading the magazine and similarly uh, in the ni- late 90s I, I sort of said you know come on let's you know and I think I I said something in derogatory not not insulting but you know kind of my own opinion about remembrance and that wasn't printed either so I, I so they, they are a little bit jaunty. so I felt very strongly that I didn't have a voice um, so I want to do RBS to, to, to have that voice. And, and at the time, Andrew Candish I'd been to school with and he, I knew he was a big Doctor Who fan and he had worked on uh, tape scenes that um, Keith had worked on. And so I knew he could do articles. So I went straight to him and he was only around the corner as well. So um, with the second one, I got more confident. I think when we, when we decided to go for a second one, Andrew Trowbridge, who of course is now known for the RTA, um, I'd been to the Salisbury local group with, and he was starting, it was around about the time of my 21st birthday, and he was starting to make more regular contact with me and coming around to my house, and we'd swap videos and talk about the show, and you know, and, and we'd move into other shows as well. Um, 
and I think with that um, he, he, we got a team together we, we moulded the, 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 the old gang as we called it and you, you obviously we were great friends because we were swapping videos and and doing stuff so I got brought you in I brought in Elaine we'd just met um, uh, you were mentioning pen friends 89 was the mega year of the pen friend dot, dot two pen friends um, it brought in so many of our friends that are still with us uh, like Elaine and other ones that like Lisa Wardle, now Lisa Hodge, who unfortunately I've lost contact with, and Rachel Sinclair, who I, who is an American pen friend of mine, Dot Who friend, and I, I, she later did some contributions for RPS. Um, in fact, she and her boyfriend actually did quite some really good material. For, um, and uh, Neil Hogan, who from Australia, who had so we we actually got one thing that I think new thing as far as the zany humour because we always made great. I was always aware that my technical stuff was not the best. We played up to that. We we kind of said, you know, I, well, the music's on there. I can't be bothered to play it, so I'm going to impersonate it, you know. And then so we 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 got we we reveled in the cheapness after a while. But uh, we did something we brought to the table, which I'm proud of, and you've got it now, which you must be proud of too, is the international aspect. Because um, we got we got Rachel from America, we got Neil from Australia. And um, it did touch America for a bit. So, hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think when I got into, into podcasting, um, it, it just happened to be that I found you know, uh, Pride 48, which was a, a, a group of, of, of sort of like-minded shows, and I met the people in, um, within it who were willing to collaborate, uh, which is always... Um, good good fun but i've not Absolutely. really i've not really found a, a similar not necessarily an lgbt group but i know there yeah. are there are horror communities and there are but I, I haven't really found one so so much i mean we we have sort of become a growing one with with, with rta but even so mm. that does center very much around talking of um, rta um as a, as a link there um obviously andrew can andrew trowbridge i met in 1986 when we did the salisbury local group the salisbury local group got started um keith joined that i'd already knew keith warren i met um through there in the summer of 86 uh the, he and troby he's always, i'm sorry he's always going to be troby to me uh became were very much a uh, double act and um i remember uh, we put on a tape uh, he um, warren did a quiz an audio quiz and we, he put on a tape scene and there was a clip what story is this from and there was a clip from invasion and i bought unit tape scene as well so i recognized the clip and he s smiled broadly at me and said you get unit too then don't you <laughs> so, um but the thing is so um, the, the local group had split up in uh, in the spring of '88, but I, as I say, got my, I was sporadically in touch with uh, Andrew Trowbridge. Later on, uh, say '891, I think, with um, Lisa came out of the blue to um, Lisa Parker, of course, uh, came out of the blue to um, order some RPSs and liked it. And um, she became a regular contributor. There's two things, actually, I have to say that she mentioned recently on when talking about RPS. I never charged for it. I, I was always too chicken to charge for it. I didn't see the point of charging for it. I, I thought I was at 20 when I started it. And I thought, well, a lot of people my age are actually going to be students and poor and, and and the copyright thing and i can't be asked i just want to do it for the love of the show and love of wanting to record with my friends so i i never charged for it it was just it was the tape when you know the, the, they said just send me an sae i'll do it electric negligible boom um and the other thing was it was actually her idea to meet up so um my girlfriend at the time wasn't very was a bit jealous um didn't need to be but and um she was dead against the idea um, as i have photographic evidence to prove it but lisa wanted to meet up and she wanted to network so i think the need to want the want to team up with like-minded fans as she is doing now with with andrew um is was always there from day one from back from 93 when we first met her um so uh it's a i see very much as you said at the very beginning podcasting is an 
natural evolutionary thing from tape to and it's a natural want to get these things done i think with with doctor it was doctor who because that was the nucleus of our interest that we had other interests we had liked other shows but doctor who was a, he was at the center and everything else kind of radiated out in those days these days um i think we'd be a bit more circumspect about what we had at the top of the totem pole as it were yeah, yeah. at the same time elaine started a tape scene called spotlight which as, as i sort of said to to the rta lot was, was sort of rta before it was rta it, before it started wasn't it yeah. exactly because it was all any sorts of any shows you wanted to do um, but I, I think the need to do that actually have been knocking around for some time because um we even during the very earliest rps times um i think actually is about 90 as early as 90 i think you you was the first one to come up with it uh you you suggested elba which stood for a little bit of everything and you i don't I, you, you did record some stuff because i recorded uh, a blake seven article for you mm. um about like one issue hostage, the, <laughs> i love i love for it to sort of pop up in at um, your parents home and i'd, yeah. I'd I'd because sort of the, copy um, it up and uh, yeah, I'd love the, to see, I'd love to hear it again. But I, I that, did that uh, a review of hostage. Because mm. that long yeah. neat um that long neat tape zine I did uh, or it was almost like a message to somebody, wasn't it? Um It was me. Uh, was it, it was an art, your first article on, on RPS. Uh, um, but it, it lost it, it long neat, wasn't yeah, it? Lost it oh, yeah, lost it. You really went for uh, it was the autumn of '89 when we were preparing RPS. I think maybe it started life actually. Nobody come to mention I mean, maybe it started life as a, a mini featurette um, that you did for me. It's like an audio message you did for me, yeah. and um, I still I've got it digitalized. I, I have the original completely but then incomplete. Yeah, because there's that there's about an hour's worth that I did because <laughs> I released it as a podcast more recently. Once you yeah. when you digitized it. I, yeah. I, I was able to sort of pretty much use all of it um, as oh, good. A, for a podcast. Good. So, good. Um, That's brilliant. Because uh, um, I, you, you did it. I, I think um, I was starting to, because I, I really thought RPS, Ray Face Ship was going to have a flash in the pan. I, I just wanted to get it out of my system. And then when people were sort of saying, when are you going to do the next one? And Troby was here, you were there, and Elaine was coming on the scene. And I thought, and Keith, um, you know, Keith had done his tape scenes. Obviously, we were there was a, a gentle rivalry between us then, you know, because <laughs> the first, uh, I mean, we're now we're brother, you know, we've been brothers for thirty odd years, you know, kind of we we we're very in tune with each other. But back then, there was a sort of friendly rivalry. And w- as soon as I and he came into my shop and I said, oh, "I'm going to do a tape scene," called Ray Face Shift, and he said, "Right, I've got to do a rival one." And, you know, he kind of rose to the, he, he picked up the gauntlet, even though I didn't throw it down. He picked it up anyway. And mm. um, and he did Dust Zone and he did two Zef Zone before I could get that out of the first RPS. Um, <laughs> and he then did DZFM, which was sort of because he uh, he does an online radio show now. I'm very good it is, too. But he'd always had this presenter, DJ, you know, he always had this kind of thing in him to do that. And he was very good at it. And so the D, the, Z, the Z, FM part of DZFM was very much his desire to be a radio DJ. And um, he produced that and, and I contributed, you know, so we both contributed to each other's rival things, which was quite nice. Uh, but by issue two, I, I was starting to think, well, I've contributed to his, he can contrib- contribute to mine. And we, we just sort of... And and uh, so the team was born, and and that team went on to do Sutton Park and the films and everything. It, it was uh, I and yeah. The, well, the the other thing I was going to say was that it was also around the time, not only of of pen friends, and and I I like to think of myself as the king of pen friends. I I think I certainly had the <laughs> yeah. most at one time. Anyway, you did. I had, I you I did. Had Fifty at one point. Um, you did. But, um, but they didn't. All we shared a lot, didn't we? we um, Heather Dell, as she was, um, mm. is still a friend to this day. Um, Elaine is still one of my best friends. Um, I there was a bodybuilder that phoned me up out of the blue and talked about Brain of Morbius for about an hour, and I never heard of Fumble Saw ever again. I, that was my first uh, pen friend thing. Data coil, wasn't it? It sounds yeah. it sounds like a sort of very high tech contraceptive. Oh. 
Wow. But, um, <laughs> yeah, D- 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 Data Coil was uh, in, in Doctor Who magazine, and um, that's where we. Because I thing is, um, I may not have. This is going off a little bit, but it's kind of building up the team. Um, you had loads, and and I think we shared loads. And there was Rachel. Uh, what was her name? I can't remember her name. She was very strange and and characterised her fridge, her pencil, and everything. And she was. She was also friends with Andrew Reid. Rachel, oh, she never contributed to RPS. I don't know why, but she was just a bit too weird even for RPS. But um, Elaine, I I actually asked my pen friend Lisa Wardle for a copy of Terminus. And at the end of Terminus was a whole lot of stuff Elaine had done with her friend Deborah. And Keith and I were absolutely fascinated by this. And we thought we, we, we'd love to be part of, you know, we'd love to do films and we'd love to do videos and we'd love to, do all this we're, we're crazy stuff and in many ways the films came from uh what kind of stuff elaine had done and she elaine came into our lives and we well, i brought her on board and she did stuff for you and and, and we just took off in the 90s that we that 89 set the tone for the 90s and that rps was part of that and and then some part came along and your you, loads of projects you had so we really exploded as a and, team um, we exploded and uh, andy who is on the um andy uh, uh, he was my pen I, I had him to myself for a number of years you did <laughs> before, yes before i, I didn't use him till 91 and i didn't really seriously start working with him until 94 when we did the films he was a big part of the films the early okay. film I'd known and, him. Um, my data he, article was in about was went in in eighty eight I think so yeah. or late eighty eight. So, so we uh, were using pen friends really nearly. You know, Lisa Wardle contributed to RPS. Rachel Sinclair contributed to RPS. Andrew Reid did a couple of articles for RPS. Um, so uh, it was a lovely time. It was exciting. Uh, and I, we I were, met. Um, I, I had three overseas pen friends. There was Kevin in Australia who I don't yeah. know anymore. And there was um, Anna in Canada who sat next to a Doctor Who pen friend of mine at school. <laughs> and, oh, wow. and, and he wasn't a very good, he wasn't the best pen friend. And I yeah. think Anna thought that my letters looked interesting and so she wrote to me. And um, we we talked a lot about writing and stuff more than, mm. she, I don't think she really knew that much about Doctor Who, but she, we wrote for ages. And I met, I met her and I met Karen um, and I'm still friends with with. I'm still friends with Anna on Facebook. We don't talk that much, but I lost contact with Kevin. But then my other overseas pen friend. I, I, Rachel Sinclair came from Oregon. I've still got a, a – when my mum died, I inherited it because she gave my mum this lovely kind of um, ceramic-topped um, surface, you know, to, to a little box to, to keep, you know, sort of hot food on. And I, I've got that on – it's pride place on my – uh, Desna, but she came over from America two years running, eighty nine and ninety, and well, it was lovely to see her. and And we exchanged tapes, we exchanged audios, and she re- contributed very much to RPS. She got a whole her old Doctor Who outfit, you know, her, her all her friends to contribute to RPS five. Um, and oh, go, going back, whilst I think of it in my mind, going back, so I think you set the tone for this whole thing, multi kind of te- telly thing with uh, elbow. And then Keith was going to do one called Power, uh, which is exactly the same concept. Then Keith, Lane actually made it happen with Spotlight. And then, of course, that transmutated years later into Round the Archive. So mm-hmm. it's, it's amazing how these things came around, really. But, um, so there's always been room for things like that. Was my, my, my American pen friend was Patrick, who I yes. continued to know. And he came over here for his 18th birthday. Well, well, he he saw the Spotlight Art uh, um, advert about two years late because they were getting them, you know, oh, yes. buying, you know yeah. and he must have just seen me and thought. But he, he he's a little bit younger than me, but actually um, not, not too much. But he was having his 18th birthday in 92, and he came over. And I um, worked with him, didn't I? Um, I worked with him on the Chad Brightly special. And, yeah, and... and, and and then he came over again and did some Sutton Park a bit later in the nineties. And then, yeah, uh, I've, I've, uh, he was always very generous in sending me gifts and stuff. And I, you know, I, nice guy. I, I was, and I, I saw him quite a lot because he was living with his wife in, um, 
um, LA when I used to go over and see Dominic. Yes. Uh, and he's come over here. He, he was briefly on an episode of the podcast in, in Hampton Court Maze um, a year or so ago. But, um, yeah, it's one of those people that when he comes to London, he'll always say, I'm, 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 I'm coming over you free. So we've kept in touch. That's uh, absolutely lovely. I, I wish we'd... Uh, I was really good friends with Rachel. I regret... I haven't found her on Facebook or anything. I I don't know if she ever married Brian. She had a long-term boyfriend called Brian who contributed to RPS, Brian Hunt. Um, he was great fun. And they went to conventions. They were very much into Star Trek as well. I think she was under the miss misunderstanding that maybe i was into star trek too i got a lot of my friends were into star trek and i got so that she would do me audios of brand new episodes of mm. next generation and i would send her audios of doctor who uh classic doctor who you know but maybe out of time poetries and things like that think, um, but um, it was such an exciting time because there were so many different interesting people we met um uh, uh, well, uh, i was also going to say that it was also the era of Audi- are doing audio messages to pen friends yes rather than writing to them um yes um and, and, you, and yeah so we definitely did, did audio messages to elaine yes um, and andrew reed and i did audio messages i did yeah. mess- audio messages to david sprakes who we i mentioned. did a prolifically i did i did um, audio messages to elaine for 18 years mm. um and i did I did a few to Lisa Wardle. Um, more recently, between in the noughties, actually, for several years in the noughties, I did uh, audio messages to Andrew Dexter, mm. who later went on to do a couple of my films. And he, they were, you know, they, they, it was, he felt he kind of missed the boat, really, with both RPS and the films. And he, he wanted to kind of make up for it. And he was a good friend. But no, there was there's a multitude of people that we got to meet, and also I must admit, uh, obviously I, I advertise. We were talking about advert- seeing adverts for things. Um, I had left was by ninety when RPS really took off, and so Ch- Andrew Trobe used to put um, adverts in for me for mm. uh, on Celestial Toy Room for Ray Face Shift and then used to bring me some of the reviews which were generally very very kind um, and there was just a few that maybe kind of didn't get it but um, most of the most of them were really good and um, he um, he would put them in for me and I think there was DWB which was the alternative Doctor mm-hmm. magazine it was done by Gary Levy or Lee or whatever his name is and he that was that got the biggest response, I think, mm. and that got the international response. And um, I, I and I still have some of the photo, the letters that were sent to me by the RPS people. Um, there was one called T Horn who would be terribly torty about everything and wanted me to write to him. I thought to myself, at least give me your Christian name because uh, T um, T T for what? T for two? T for you know? Um, <laughs> And there was another one who, there was one called Math, Captain Matthew Hirsch. Sorry, Captain Matthew Hirsch, if you're reading, you're listening to this. But um, he was very supercilious about um, British regional accents. And then set, sent me a check, which was woefully inadequate for all, for all the issues that he previously, and he didn't even cover conversion costs. I don't know who he was kidding. but um, And he, you know, I think he's, there was a funny bit. Uh, in reference to uh, to R- Dudley Simpson, the musician, uh, I think Troby put in, you know, in a company some car springs, and this guy actually a company put his auto in with some string springs. I don't uh, no, that was a joke. Um, <laughs> but um, and the other the other one, the, the classic was the guy that wrote to me and asked me for a job. Uh, he's you know, I, I he obviously had no idea. <laughs> that this was a tape scene and we did our own covers and it was amateur produced. We didn't charge for it. And I was a, a shot worker on minimum wage. And um, he wrote to me and asked me, if, you know, I, I, can I be an illustrator? And I thought to myself, this guy could be married with four kids and he wants me to give him a wage that will sustain that when I'm living at home and my parents on minimum wage. I mean, mm. I, I had to write to him and, and, um, you know, gently explain that you know, I'm just doing this for fun absolutely no profit whatsoever and uh, oh, 
but it was like it was, it was a lovely thing that somebody actually wanted the job. Wanted the sounds of it, you've got because um, obviously a lot of you hear a lot of podcasters saying that they barely hear from their listeners. There are one or two, um, and I think some some podcasts play up to their listeners and and they mention them a lot, and so that generates things yeah. back. And you know, I, I I I do that myself to a point, or, but usually yeah. um, if 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 they're become their, their guests or they've become part of the team. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, I mean, to act, they, they, uh, it was a lot harder for your audience to to contact you back in the day, technically, mm. in that they had to write a letter and post it. And these days, you don't even have to do that, and yet it seems harder to get feedback. Than I you think did I, I mean, in the most of, most of them are scanned now and and in the archive. But um, <coughs> I did get quite a few letters. Um, mm. One of which, of course, was from Tony Derbyshire, who to this day I've never met and has completely fallen off my radar, much to my regret. Uh, but he um, was a chap from Lang- uh, L- Lancashire. Was it Lancashire? No, not Lancashire. Tony Derbyshire. Dar- no, Tony Derbyshire from Lancashire. Maybe it was Lancashire. Yes, well, sorry, it was Lancashire. He was very keen on RPS and he contributed some articles um, with each article he got more and more into it and more and more into the RPS style and he rapidly became I would say even more popular than Troby as, mm. as far as a contributor goes and he he was my star turn in the end you know uh, so he was like Lee Freeman on Sutton Park you know it was kind of like whoa you Pretty know if you got something from him it was going to be good and it was going to steal the show really um, and I, to this, I, I offered him about three different parts, three or four different parts in my films, and he was interested in principle, but never met, never met me. I still think to this day it was Andrew Reid in disguise, or, 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 or maybe it was Lee in disguise because he, yeah. but, but, but they both vanished. So. Yeah, they both vanished in the banana. Yeah. And, 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 and the only photograph that Tony ever gave of himself was uh, at Longleat. Um, when he was about ten, um, he, I think yeah, I think he was a, about two years younger than me. But he he was massively popular with his article. He was very witty and really got up. Yes, totally got up. Yes, yeah, and I remember, um, I remember his article was being very good. Yeah, he, 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 he very droll, very funny, and because I knew he could do accents, so I cast him as an American in um, One More Bow. Um, do you remember Toby James playing that part mm. in One More? Mm. He, he was the original choice. I thought to myself, I'm going to work with him physically well, uh, if it kills me. But uh, uh, I wrote uh, the script. He hadn't contacted me. I said, well, I'm sorry, bloke. I'm sorry, mate, but you're fired. <laughs> uh, I, I had a number of other pen friends which weren't so well-known or maybe as, as far as, you know, that they didn't sort of... Um, escape my within my little world um yeah. they didn't become known to other people who, who are really good and, and i've always thought oh i'll bump into them again in fandom yeah. particularly now every more people are up but they do just some 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 of those names just never appear, appeared on social media or... i know totally where you're coming from on that because they you know, tony derbyshire lee freeman of course they're, 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 they're some park and I guess just Rachel Sinclair and it, all these people are, haven't actually resurfaced on on social media, and it's I hope they're all right. I hope they're out there. You know, they were lovely, lovely human beings, and I, I, I've, you know, I enjoy working with them, and they they left a wonderful legacy behind them. I, I just hope they're I hope they're all right. I hope they're enjoying their lives wherever they are. Now, I like because because as a, as um you know I was thinking I haven't heard. The RPS is really since back in the day because yeah. they were only on tape, and I haven't had anything to play tapes on for ages. So oh, I'd like to in, I'd like you to indulge me, and I'll say something yeah. to start with. But um, uh, l- listeners, I, uh, I I've I've got more into the to the job more more recently on RTA as far as doing articles. Although the way that I do articles with you, Nick, is that sometimes we you know we watch we watch it we were in the well, when, when we we're able yeah. to be in the same room we watch a bit and yeah. then we stop and we we come and we we talk on the spot um when i do things with with toppy 
we, we, we sort of just have a general conversation. It's nothing written yeah. down. It's nothing too formal. I'm, I've never I really liked anything writing. written down. Not even I write, I write things down now. When I did my on spec, uh, I did an on spec um, look at the Magra Terra and the two Eric Sayward Dalek books last year. And I, again, I, I, I think we, we don't write things down now unless we're doing something formal that's going to be published. But, but back um, in the RPS days, I tended to do articles which could be done um, quite with um, that they were the more silly articles that you, you did, or at least those are the ones I remember anyway. Yeah. Um, what, what, are the, what are the articles that I did for you? Um, well, it, Picking up from what you're, where you're coming from there, I think you were a bit ahead of ahead of time, really. I mean, in terms of impromptu, I think it's, ba- it's certainly well the way we go now, um, because podcasts it wouldn't see it wouldn't work. I, I know because uh, we it's the podcasts universally are more conversational. They they seem that's the one big thing that separates them from um, uh, you know the tape scenes worked in their time and they were fine and everything and you had a lot of fun doing them but they wouldn't work now because the whole thing has become much more conversational now what you did for me uh, obviously first thing you ever did for me was um lost in longley which of course mm. i'm delighted to hear it's gone out uh, that's brilliant um i think you had already prepared it and and i said i'm looking for asking well how you know i've got this and you you did me a tape and and i thought oh yeah and um and I truncated it, obviously, because mm, yeah. it was it goes on for about ninety minutes. So I, I kind yeah. of I did the best of, um, and I love that bit where you know, sort of, you've got all these monsters and everything, and all these props and everything, and you you interview your brother who was about seven at the time, mm. and um, and he go, "What's your favourite bit?" Oh, I like the TARDIS, <laughs> and I kind of used a bit. I, uh, I ended the article with a clip from Greatest Show in the Galaxy with Sylvester saying, "Your enthusiasm is overwhelming." <laughs> but, um, but yeah that was that was your first one the second one was i think you oh, you also did me a season because i was very keen on people's opinions about the season and and, mm-hmm. and any season to be honest i i you know if i was doing any kind of a a zine or a a podcast today i i get loads of opinions i you know i i, I love pe- hearing what people think um and i would I was getting season reviews from all of you. I, I got uh, yourself, Elaine, Troby, Keith, uh, Elaine. Yeah, did I mention Elaine? Probably did. But um, yes, all of these people I got I got whole season reviews from. And uh, so you did a season review, a season 26 overview. But again, I think I don't think you wrote it down. I don't think you ever wrote anything down. <laughs> um, I mean, maybe, I, 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 as I say, I think with four, you did a look at the comic marts. Again, it was very on spec. I think you kind of had a vague script and, and Troby and Lee's, uh, Troby, not, sorry, Troby and Keith and them, we, we all sort of chipped in to the intro, but it mo- mainly concerned your reviewing of kind of the comic marts and the kind of things you got at comic marts. And I think Andy made an appearance, mm-hmm. kind of interviewed Andy on audio uh, 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 from late night, uh, late 90 uh, mm. comic mark and uh, five we just chatted with uh, that was actually five was ahead of its time because uh, that was the fan special and we we just chatted about the show um, and with that, we, that was the first one we got a major contribution from America because mm. uh, the, the whole American fans were talking and they were <laughs> they were great fun and um, yeah they said that was just a chat there Nightmare, you you did double. You came in with me on double duds for six with Nightmare of Eden. Mm. In fact, I think I might, I've done a few clips of that, so mm. that probably. Uh, but no, that was great fun. I think I remember us recording it in about five minutes because your dad was about to pick you up, and um, it was it, it, we really had to rush it a bit. But um, and I think because you, you'd already had, always like Nightmare of Eden, so had I. So we kind of, mm. and it was to. The background music was uh, the calendar song from Boney M. Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we were going to put a clip of a mandrel going, Rah! and you kind of uh, you stopped in the middle of the article that, oh, uh, we were going to put mandrel in there, weren't we? <laughs> and you go, oh, well, oh, well growl. <laughs> and kind of, we kind of did a man, homemade mandrel. Um, but uh, that, was, that, was, that was the nearest thing you get to a conventional article. Seven, I can't remember. Um, 
eight you did eccentrics and you did a kind of top 10 uh, mm. of eccentrics we, you did it like a chart rundown yeah and i think you ad libbed tremendously i think you were you're on the the, the cusp of and um, some so you certainly done beaches by then and you were on the cusp of doing um some some, uh, some park so uh it, you know it came i think you you knew basically who you were going to talk about but you, you kind of really beefed it up a little bit um uh nine uh, i can't remember. it's a long time since i've heard them uh, i think there was um yeah yeah i think there was a, some memories and things like that but tw- i think fast forwarding a little bit i remember the I, oh um there was one you did as a gel guard uh, oh, from yes. three doctors <laughs> you, you and elaine did a um a gel, it, like a points of view on gel guards as to why you weren't brought back in after <laughs> finishing um uh, that was quite fun because <laughs> Uh, uh, Elaine is famous for her liking of Peter Davison. If you suddenly had this gel guard that fancied Peter Davison, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I'm Peter Davis. <laughs> no, 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 you're not supposed to. You're a boy gel guard. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was quite fun. Um, and uh, of course, you, I, I, I think Invasion had just come out on video, or the, the, the surviving episode had just come out on video, and um, we were watching it together. And I think. It, you found a lot of innuendos in it. So mm. we thought, oh, let's do that for the next bit. But, you know, you were never a lover of conventional write-it-down ones. Troby mm. did them. I did them. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, sometimes they came out with mixed results anyway, but actually that's very much the way I wouldn't write. If, if somebody said, oh, do something on this show, and, I, you know, I wouldn't write it down now because podcasting isn't, it would sound so false now. Um, it, it, it's not what it's all about now. So, um, yeah, it's just a conversation like this. Um, it's but, probably a bit like um, when I send messages into a big fatty online. A lot of people write when they send messages to him. They they just talk about what they've done at shopping or yeah. or, or referring to things that he's mentioned. Whereas I have all my characters coming in, or I have little subplots within. Yeah, exactly. know, I, I send little stories and stuff, um, and and. and uh, you know, it, it, all, it all fits in and probably doing silly things for you gave a nice variety with all the other things. That were yeah, there. I mean, the, the only problem I think with, uh, there was room, in back then there was room for both. I mean, mm. Choby always did send me some very good articles, um, but he wrote them down and researched them and, and, and did stuff. And I, I did them and there was always room for fun. There was always room for a little bit of give and take here and there and um but yeah it it would it would just fall flat these days if you if you tried to write something so by all means something on the website or a Mm. book or you know the script or whatever you know that's always going to be written but i I think yeah i mean it it would just wouldn't work today and i Um, I don't i'm perfectly happy with the way it's turned out really am i right in saying that there was a an edition which you had handed over to somebody else there were two editions that mm-hmm. i handed over so because i was the thing with me is i always felt rps was going to go on as long as it was going to go on I, I i never had any ambitions to, for it to go on age it, it would serve its purpose and then i would know when it was time to go apart from the fact that i didn't know it was time to go i i, I nine i felt was wasn't going the way i wanted to and i was going to cut the whole thing and then nine turned out all right so we went on to 10 11 i did a, a bit about planet of evil and i wanted to do something really different and i wanted to do it from the point of view of my six-year-old self behind this the, the mm. and i went in a direction that was a bit radical and people like um well ba- basically some of the team were kind of saying or oh, you know kind of showed signs of being a bit embarrassed with this as far as I, 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 and I bit well, maybe I've gone too far. And I thought, right, I'm going to, I'm going to pull it. I'm going to, the next one's going to be the last one. I'm going to, I'm not going to do it anymore. And then I think first Keith and then Andrew Candish, or maybe the other way around, said, no, 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 we'll do one. We'll do one. Yeah, we'll do the next one. And I thought, yeah, you know, I, and it was at the time when I was starting to give my stuff written stuff to film wise to to them in fact i i and in 94 i i did they when we did traitors of twilight reality they directed both of those guys directed stuff i've written 
Mm. And I thought, yeah, well, let's see what they do. Sit back and enjoy the show. And I did just some articles, obviously, but and I don't regret it really. Um, I think actually the RPS versions of their their RPS versions perhaps were a little bit more successful than their films. Um, but yeah, I, I handed over. I was ready to quit, but I was persuaded to have a stay of execution first by Keith and then by Andrew. Keith, I know, isn't very keen on his version. I thought he did a perfectly good job, but it was technically better than mine. Um, maybe it was unconventional in that I didn't use the same music. I always used, I always started because I suppose it was had a nice wacky, wonky kind of feel to it, which would want the whole tone I wanted for the tape scene. Southern Rhapsody, uh, the, 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 the jolly part of Southern Rhapsody, which was the opening theme to Southern Television in the 60s, the 60s right to the 80s um uh written by richard ansell he that was my theme because i'd, I'd gotten a very old recording of it i was obsessed with the tune when i was a kid and i recorded it which is why you've got that little bit of a six-year-old me going it started because i kind of uh, saying to my mum because we didn't have no there was no shut up we're recording in those mm. days it was just <laughs> it was uh, you, you said what you damn well like because you couldn't shut the the family up not even myself um and I, that was my tune, um, and Keith didn't use it in his his version. I think Andrew did, but mm. and I think he, you know he's not very proud of that one. I think he's too harsh on himself on that one. Andrew Candish was okay. He made the mistake of actually going for something that was a bit of a short lived wonder, which was the C a hundred. I don't know if you were CR one hundred. Uh, it was a fifty minute tape, <laughs> usually a. Um, for those of you who don't know, for, uh, most of the tapes are either 60 minutes or forty or 90 minutes, uh, C1, C90 or C60, uh, with 45 minutes or half an hour on each side. And I, in the olden days, there was a C120, which was an hour each side, which weren't very reliable. They were quite thin tapes, which tended to break. Mm. Um, and with suddenly... In the 90s or the late 80s, there was a C100. And I pointed out to him, they're not readily available in the shops. You can go into WH Smith and get one. That's about it. Mm-hmm. If you haven't got a WH Smith, you're, you're screwed, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and I tried to persuade him not to record this on a C100, but he did. And he had, we had to do a truncated, put out a truncated version of 13 because it was 50 minutes long and the people didn't have 50 minute tapes. So that was my only regret, but he, he actually pulled it off very nicely. And personally, frankly, so did Keith. So I was very happy to hand them over. And if somebody else had come up and said, Oh, can I do one? I'd probably say yes too. But by 12, I think we reached 96. The films had been established. I was much more interested in doing the films. Spotlight had started. She was, Elaine was carrying on the torch. And I, I think I'd had enough by then. So, uh, and I, I remember coming to you. Uh, you, you actually gave me one of my favorite quotes about quitting. <laughs> uh, I went, I remember meeting you for lunch and saying, you know, uh, Paul, I'm thinking of quitting RPS. I think I've, I've said my piece and, uh, now it's time to step down. And, and he's, and you said to me, yes, there's only, uh, so many times you can say the, uh, the invisible enemy is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> there's someone who knows me very well um, but, and yeah of course again, one of the berated stories that I, I'm rather fond of I like, um, I like past me I was very witty <laughs> <laughs> so you you were you were you, you tickled me very much with that comment <laughs> and uh, it was yeah about about 95 I decided that well about 93 I <laughs> three years before I quit I actually uh, yeah, I, I was, I was, I was ready to go. I think, um, but I'm so. I actually apologise in advance. Uh, I really, for the most part, I made a huge hash of the last one. I tried to do it as two issues. We didn't have the material for two issues. I think we were all tired of moving on to other projects anyway, including myself. And um, uh, yeah, it was. It should have been a C sixty rather than a two C ninety. I, I discovered as I was doing a French trans, a fresh transfer, not a French transfer, um, yeah. in uh, for of the final issue that there is actually a side that's completely blank. 
you know, it's, it's two issues long and it's three sides. So you've perhaps got you could nothing. have done it. Perhaps you should nothing. have done it. Perhaps you it might have worked better if you'd done an, either two sixties or a ninety and a sixty. Or I think just a ninety or, or even a sixty. I, I, I should have been far more circumspect as to what I put in it. I, yeah. I and that's the other thing. I, I, I don't regret RPS for a moment because it, it was so exciting. It brought us all together and it achieved what I wanted it to achieve. But I think I wasn't a strong enough editor. I think I should have actually said to some of my friends actually uh, can you go back to the drawing board please i didn't want to upset anybody um but i yeah i just didn't i i wasn't tight enough with the editing and yeah it well, was a lot of fun but i that i made a real hash of that last one it it shouldn't have been two issues long for goodness sake it, it just i'm just awkward about it now it's just um i it, i didn't do very well and it was just i didn't encourage others to do well either so no i, I it, it was it, it, it ended up as a bit of a so i suppose i was in the middle of probably my biggest film at the time as well you were doing some part paul was um keith was doing i think keith was i don't know what keith was doing but um uh, <laughs> elaine was doing spotlight and we were all moved on to other things by then um oh the, you were talking about letter you know reactions uh, there was a guy called David Bridge who wrote to us, very nice guy from Manchester, I think, and he was a great fan. And he um, would write us lovely letters, he would record us lovely letters. Mm. And um, we, we, you know, he was, he was, he kind of came up with some strange things. I kind of, he was, we were talking about, we were sticking up for NAF monsters, and uh, he uh, he roared at one point, "There's nothing wrong with the Merca." <laughs> and I thought, like, okay. Put the hammer down. There's nothing wrong with the murder. <laughs> was, he was really getting it. And he was stopped a recording because a wasp came into the room. <laughs> Why does this rewind and start again? Um, but uh, no, he was he was great fun. Um, and there was just so many nice things to be said. I mean, I'm deeply embarrassed by some of it. I'm deeply proud of others, other bits of it. Um, and I think it's great that... You, you, your podcasting and uh, um, RTA's podcasting, and I'm I'm here working with you. Uh, I I'm love. I've always loved recording, and um, this is a good. You know, this is probably even more relevant now because you know it's it's much more personal. It's much more um, freer, and um, it's yeah, it's it gets to the heart of the matter. So um, I I, we really have kind of. It's nice that it's still, we're still recording, we're still communicating. Hello, listeners. It is me, Cuthbert the Robot. So sorry to interrupt the chat, but at this point we're going to share with you some actual clips from Nick's RPS tape scene, just to give you a feel for how it all sounded. After the clips, we will return to Paul and Nick for the final part of the story, and then it will be time to say goodbye for this episode. Anyway, I do hope you enjoy all of what is coming up next. Personally, I think it is all very entertaining! Exclamation. Loads of articles for you in, in this pilot 60 minutes of fun. From a fan whose views, more often than not, don't match up with the rest of fandom. You may feel like a new person at the end of the tape, or feel like a refund. Now it's time to dematerialise. Hope you enjoyed this pilot issue. Write and tell me about it, what the heck. My thanks to Andrew Candish for his articles, and Keith Musselwhite for his advice. And now, from the depths of my luxury millionaire recording studio in Los Angeles, a Jew. is Mr. Andrew Trowbridge, who will be contributing a thrilling article in the course of this. And this is the issue where we're script liberated. There we are. We're doing it totally unscripted, but we keep our sharp standards up. Uh, well, <laughs> and... Keep it up, keep it up. Keep it up. Don't Wait. dry, just because there's no script. And why we have carols on is... <laughs> because Carol wouldn't give them to anyone else. Yes. And now we change the rotor. 
when the spotlight falls on Warren Langdon. Ah! And we jump a doctor for Tomb of the Cybermen. The story is brilliant. Trapped within the dark and chat corridors and antechambers, but with no help available to them, the group is basically armed with firearms. Only one man has a hand in saving the whole group, but only to suppress his thirst for power, that man being Klieg. Evil, corrupt, and unprepared for the awesome power frozen within the depths of the city. For me, season 26 was rather a mixed bag. In many ways, it was a lot better than season 25 or season 24, but also there were certain things which I wasn't completely satisfied with. Yes, indeed, I'm back with some new backing music with the same style of reviewing. And why not? season 26, and what a season it was too. And why not? It started off with a singularly spectacular story, Battlefield. Carrot juice rolls okay for a healthy diet every day. Limber up and muesli flakes will help you sleep at night during the day. It'll keep you wide awake. I'd like to ask this man here, sitting next to here, what he thought of the Doctor Who exhibition. What did you like best, Graham? Um... I liked the TARDIS. Your enthusiasm is overwhelming. Wait. Uh, subsequently informed by diminutive Cyberman that we could be in for a five hour wait. Treat this as the obvious joke it is. Group ahead of us gets bored, they leave. We all move up five spaces. 1330. Begin to have serious doubts about the organisation, if that's the right word, of the event, bearing in mind that we have a current velocity of approximately 20 feet per hour. I understand that certain fast growing varieties of bamboo actually exceed this speed, reference Guinness Book of Records. Season 26 was one of great variety, let down only by its first and last episode. There were main, main, many moments which will remain classic in many memories. Some very good cliffhangers, with added bonus of some very good ugly face puddings from Sylvester. But I'm sure you're all eager to know how I voted. You're not? Well, hard luck, because here I go. Listeners may be shocked to learn, but I don't really care, that I voted survival last. Shock, horror, gasp. The reason that this came out so bad can all be thanks to episode three. Let me say there wasn't much I disliked in the first two episodes. Episode one came out as my best of the season. It was new and very different, with a predictable yet effective cliffhanger. Episode 2 had some very interesting moments, and a quite shocking ending, but the antics of Midge, the stuffed cat, the little girl, and, and rushed ending to the story proved a trifle embarrassing, whereas there were some very good moments, the motorbike crash being a good example, it fell flat when it could have been the highlight of the season. Ghostlight came third, episode 1 being good, with some very nice, light-hearted moments. Ep 2 moving along nicely, and episode 3 being all go, with some very nice concepts, and a great ending. But did anyone understand it? Battlefield was my second choice, a story which I'm sick of hearing slagged off. It didn't live up to remembrance, in my view, but possessed some very good moments, at the end of episodes 2 and 3, for example. Some good acting, in uh, and many moving scenes i.e. the restoring of sight to the blind lady, the, spe spe the speech by the Doctor to Morgane about nuclear war, and a humorous ending was well needed. Despite episode one being sl a slight letdown, it held up rather nicely. Curse had to come first, a very moving, exciting story, a mixture of new and old, with a fine cast and range of monsters, a little confusing in places perhaps, but with a good ending and a nice twist which added to the brilliant character and costume of Ace. An exceptional story with few flaws and a great duffel coat. A brill season all in all, and despite the cliché, dare I say, it was Ace. Battlefield, crap. Curse of Fenric, crap. Ghostlight, not bad, busy about the plot. Survival, was absolutely fantastic. I <laughs> Season 27 should be written by Rona Munro. Mind you, that's if we ever get a season 27. Mr. Andrew Reed reveals all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Right. Hello. Uh, 
Um, <clears throat> being as I am a keen dilettante, dilettante, <laughs> dilettante me. Oh gosh, dilettante. What was I talking about? Oh yes, being a keen dilettante, as I said earlier, a lover of the fine arts, of the more refined cultural aspects of the art world, I thought I would like to educate you all, because being educated like what I am, I cannot have helped but notice a certain piece of Doctor Who merchandising which fully, fully deserves my treatment as it is so profound and intellectually absorbing and all that. I quiver with tremulous excitement, and indeed I feel that I am not worthy to speak of such a magnificent article of human productivity. I humbly shall attempt to review that masterpiece, the Dalek Lolly. Mm. Yes, four years, or maybe not quite as long as that, the Dalek Lolly has lain dormant waiting to capture the culture world by storm, and now I almost feel that that time has come upon us all, but let me tell you about the Dalek Lolly. Well, firstly, if you take off the splendid paper wrapper, indeed, I think that this is paper worth staring at all day, with its paperiness and quality. This is paper for the modern world. This is the kind of paper that made Britain great. This is the paper that will go down in history as being paper of that special class of paper that a quintessentially accumulative correlation of infrequent interpositions on the refined aspect of paradoxical corporeality. But leaving the paper to one side for a uh, one side for a moment, we turned to the lolly. Unfortunately, I was so absorbed by the magnificent and wonderfully stimulating, vivid and passionately passionate paper that the lolly had melted. But luckily for the interests of my dignified review, it left a rather interesting puddle. There are puddles and there are puddles. Yes, indeed there are. But this was a puddle above and beyond a puddle. Firstly, it was wet. That was the first thing that I noticed. This is the sort of thing which makes my incredible reviewing talents so unique. I was immediately captivated by the way the 60-watt bulb of my kitchen shimmered translucently and vividly, not to mention passionately across the placid and still surface of this great puddle. It lay there on the table in all its wetness, slowly dripping onto the carpet. After this momentous occasion in my life, I, I don't think I could ever look at another ordinary puddle in the street without thinking of those precious moments. Please be quiet. Despite its epic length, the final story of season six ends on a pretty inconclusive note. Okay, so the Doctor is apparently sent spinning towards his exile. Jamie and Zoe seem to have been deposited back in their own time zones. But what about all the Earth soldiers? Did they really get home unscathed? And who are these time old persons anyway? It's only with the advantage of hindsight provided by the next 20-odd, in some cases very odd, seasons, that one can truly appreciate the grandiose scale of the saga devised by Mr. Dixon, Mr. Hulk, or, if you prefer, Talon Mac. What follows is just a bit of harmless fun, but at least consider the evidence that will be presented. You might even be begin to agree that there's more to the war game than first meets the visual cortex. The root cause of everything appears to be Jamie, no surprise there. Somewhere along the line, he appears to have developed a faulty memory as to the exact year he met the Doctor. In part one of Underwater Menace, a brief reference is made to a certain Robert Burns. Understandably, Jamie has never heard of the wee laddie since, quote, To Jamie, it's 1746. Robert Burns wasn't born until 1759. I very much enjoyed RPS 2 whilst doing my paper round. In fact, I almost fell off my bike in anticipation, especially as it featured me. Sorry, ego. Anyway, a total super clad of... <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, a totally super califragilistic expialidocious 
issue, although I can't remember for the life of me what was on it. It was very good anyway. Tell your friends to buy it. That's what they've told me to say anyway. Two, three, and we brought Andrew Candice with us for more articles. We're from Red Face Shift, but when we come when back, we got back, we found. Elaine Bull, could I have your comment, please? No, you can go away. No. Um, yes, well, uh, personally, I didn't spend that much money this time. I didn't I didn't spend any money, hardly, really. I bought a couple of books. You come each time, though, don't you? More, more often than not, yeah, I do. Yeah. What, what a chat you do, I uh, Peter Davison, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Oh, well, you, you pick up things that you don't normally find in the shops, and, you know, if you look around, you might find something at a reasonable price. Because so, John Fitton's prices are very expensive. And, uh... I'm all John Fitton, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Uh, Hello. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, this person over here now, Mr. Andy Ching. Yes. Well, give me that. <laughs> What's it doing? I was looking everywhere, didn't I? I don't know how hard it is to find a pair of Doctor Who underpants. Bloke had them on Bria's been flashing around, but I could have found them now. I shouldn't have chucked them away ten years ago. Over to you. <laughs> oh. Uh, this, is, this is my third... You, you remember, recognise me? Yes. <laughs> um, this is... Yeah, shh. Out now. <laughs> Get your copy from our friend. No, um, <laughs> um, no, this is my first... One and I've got quite a quite a lot of interesting stuff. <laughs> I've got quite a lot of interesting stuff in here, so uh, I'm fairly impressed. <laughs> yes, yes, it's all it's all Andy. So. Yeah, but um, I think we've uh, well we'll we'll go back a bit later on when the when the the big crowds have moved away. So uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> oh look, here is a sapphire and steel book. I wonder who would like a sapphire and steel book. Isn't it a nice sapphire and steel book? Would you like to make a nice comment on it? You might even have it. I will. I will. Next time. What do you think? Well, I think you get a nice plastic bag with that, don't you? Yes, you do. That's a nice little label telling you how much it costs. That's right. Yes. Right. I know I'm going to interview this person here. His name is Paul Chandler. Ah, hello. Hello. <laughs> so what did you think of the comic art today? Well, I thought it was quite good, really. I bought some books, uh, nothing to do with Doctor Who, actually, but uh, never mind. Uh, I did buy some things, and I'm going to go and buy a Star Trek video next. Star Trek, don't talk about Star Trek, this is a Doctor Who fancy. Oh, sorry about that. Um, well, I, then i better go now, then. Right, thank you. Um, right. Marooned in the exospace time continuum. <laughs> In the 1990s saw only one convention under my belt, as I'd intended, but which one to go for? As a piece of paper called Exospace Convention was thrust into my hand last October, I decided that that should be the one. A year and a bit later, a trudge up a hill in Exeter, and in a very smart, the very smart Imperial Hotel, there it all was. And amongst the merry band of fans were several RPS veterans, such as Mr. Trowbridge, Mr. Chandler and Mr. Andrew Reid. This was, of course, to be Graham Williams' first convention for some time, and ended up being a tribute to... Well, 
Here I am, deep inside Nick's luxury recording suite, deep in Los Angeles. God, there's buttons and dials and knobs and things all over the place. Ah! Ah! And here's a copy of Remembrance of the Daleks! Ah! Ooh. Now, what does this button do? Oh, it's all gone dark. I'll press it again. Ah, that's better. Now then, what does this one do? Ah, it turns... Uh, no, it doesn't. It switches on Nick. Ah, ah. Backing music. Backing music. That's what we need now. Here's one, I, here's one I've never told anyone. Um, because we've lived by a river for ages, mm-hmm. um, soon after Terror of the Zygons, ah. I will admit to wondering whether the Scarison was going to come up <laughs> But I, I was all right, because we had a bridge down the road, and obviously it couldn't... <laughs> <laughs> so me... I could get as far as the watercrest beds, and then it wouldn't be able to get... Then you saw the BBC video and realised it was... But at the time, you think, ah, uh-huh. that's hard. <laughs> but it's always a thing, like Ben Elton said the other evening, you hear a creak, you pull the covers up further, and I mean, it could be... Obviously, you're going to be all right. right. We'll come back and interview you when you're a little lonely. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. We'll relieve the pressure now by ceasing. And the extra commentary in the background was provided by Ed and Richard. <laughs> and not to forget Margaret. You said early stuff you can't really remember. No. I mean, did you ever experience the sort of behind-the-sofa stuff? Yeah. Funny enough, for season 18. Yeah? Oh, one story in particular. Yes? Yeah. Name the names. Meglos. Mm. Okay. I mean, I was... It was... The thing with Meglos, sorry... The thing, the thing with Megalos was, is that in fact you had the Doctor, who was the good character, yeah. and you had the other Doctor, and uh, through yeah. through the eye through the eyes of what I'd have been nine, ten years old, you weren't sure quite who was who, and having the Doctor, sort of suddenly turn up with like a, a cactus on his head. <coughs> you see, Black Guardian again. <laughs> I sat th- Megalos. I got. I sat through Megalos fine. Yeah. Because so when I got to two. Did it? Did it cause problems? And I couldn't watch the rest yeah. of Megalos. Do you remember Purgatory? No. Is he sorry? In Banzo the other week. <laughs> 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 uh, I don't remember any purpose stories when he was playing the Doctor apart from Five Doctors and of course and the Ultimate Adventure. And the oh, and the yeah, Ultimate. Well, I don't remember that one. I don't remember that. The, the, the such a long time ago. The, the, the subplot was more interesting when someone lost their wallet. I thought, <laughs> <laughs> the, the Five Mushes of Doctor Who. Yeah, in in 1981. 91. But I mean, I, I suppose probably my oldest recollection is Revenge of the Cybermen. But even then, I only sort of remember remember the monster rather rather than the actual story. Yeah. Of it. What was um, the monster? <laughs> <laughs> Tom Baker. <laughs> Having seen a wide range of stories from the show, I can say that I've seen a great deal worse than Nightmare part of a season I enjoy the majority of, except perhaps perhaps uh, Creature from the Pit. Yes, they, uh, they pinched in Fateful Monster idea f- for that story from Voice to the Bottom of the Sea, so uh, I wasn't pleased. Right, back to Nightmare. The production standards are, well, as good as ever. Take that as you will. What about the mandrels? What about the mandrels? <laughs> good... Oh, and the growling bit. <laughs> Growl! <laughs> Growl! That's supposed to be a clip there. Yeah, the clip. Okay. What about the vandals? Good friends of mine, as it happens, along with the Nymon. Wonderful chaps, all of them. So, back to the mandrels. So, monsters wearing flares, so what? Why can't people just take things at face value and accept what they see? Why, oh, why, oh, why, oh, why can't people accept that this is a fantasy and that mandrels from Eden have flared feet? I don't know. Throughout the story, we are treated to a number of good cliffhangers. Three of them, funnily enough. And the cast is particularly good, too. Especially Louis Viander as a twist, despite Bob Baker's dislike of his interpretation. Plays an excellent ham professor. Twist with a twist, as he turns out to be the baddie at the end. Well, he has a foreign accent. So what could you expect, mein Capitan? Still, he's a lovable rogue, really. Almost. Doctor, Doctor, I didn't want to be involved in all this. Tell them, tell them that I only did it for the sake of funding my research. Do you understand all this? You are a scientist. No way. Drawing theories aside, hmm? what did season 16 really mean to you? 
Oh dear. Oh well. Uh, you know, I think season sixteen is the best of the Graham Williams one from my from my point of view. Um, season six, fifteen and seventeen, of course, I liked. Season sixteen, I liked. But fifteen was plagued a bit by the hangover from the Hinchcliffe years. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but in terms of sort of overall style of the series, sixteen is perhaps the most consistent. I think um, it's also got perhaps the highest quality of stories all the way through the season each one's of a sort of consistent standard I think um, it's also recognisable that, that they're all Williams stories um, Horror Fang Rock for instance fits into fits into the Hinchcliffe mould and you wouldn't even notice the difference um, and for some reason I always, I always remember thinking that Destiny of the Daleks looked far more modern than some, even some of the some of the J&T things I don't, I don't know why that's, that's just me being strange but <laughs> And now, ladies and gentlemen of the RPS tape scene, we introduce Rachel Sinclair and her double duds. As often occurs in Doctor Who fandom, one tends to have a special fondness for those episodes one viewed first. As I was first introduced to the perambulating Time Lord via Colin Baker's Sixth Doctor, I tend to look on the stories from his much maligned period more favorably than many fans. The Ronnie was introduced to me before the Master. Well, actually, I met them both at the same time. At any rate, I was favorably impressed by the Time Lady's initial appearance. Kate O'Mara does an excellent job as the cold, contemptuous Ronnie. As most viewers are aware, Time and the Ronnie had the misfortune to be written as a Colin Baker story, then hastily adapted to serve as Sylvester McCoy's introduction following Baker's unceremonious departure from the series. However, this kind of unexpected major alteration doesn't necessarily have to be detrimental. Witness Honor Blackman's success in The Avengers, working on scripts originally penned for Ian Hendry's character. Similarly, I don't feel that Time and the Ronnie fares so badly by its new Doctor. The Doctor has always tended to be confused following a regeneration, and on this occasion his confusion is made worse by the Ronnie's amnesia drug. I personally don't find Sylvester McCoy's characterization erratic, as some reviewers complained. Instead, I feel he made a fine job of borrowing bits of personality from his predecessors, bouncing expertly from Trotonesque to Tom Bakerish in the scene where he awakens in the Ronnie's lab. Have you ever wondered what an Aussie Doctor Who fan's perspective of the show is like? Are you curious about the international aspects of Doctor Who? Do you ever wish to have heard news reports about Doctor Who in the 60s or 70s? How about on-the-spot reports and interviews? Well, this is the material for you. Doctor Who 2000, the 90-minute audio zine that endeavours to take Doctor Who to the next century and beyond. Not only the contributors international, we also spend time on the audio recordings of non-archive Doctor Who episodes. Approximately 24 minutes each, in fact. Issue 13 is now available, sporting an excellent cover by Lee Freeman. When Nick asked me to do an article on eccentrics in Doctor Who, my immediate thought was... Um, here I am again. Yes, well, this, this bit follows on directly from part one because I needed more time to finish this article off. Um, he was an unpretentious, fun-loving person, almost hippie-like, a student of life rather than boring old books. His performance in The Invasion of Time, not only just about his best, but is also an excellent example of this. His flippancy would often reach dangerous heights in the face of adversity. He'd always remain unnervingly confident with a witty comment subtly aimed at the protagonist. He was performing the innocent as regards violence and hate and would speak out when he came up against them. And sometimes the only audience left play to would be us at home and how we laughed. At the risk of this issue becoming a Tom Baker special, I'd rather wind this article I'd better wind this article up. I hate farewells. Looking back over the Tom Baker years, I found loads of things to say, but Nick wouldn't let me say them all, and loads of clips to use. There is no doubt that Tom Baker's performance was the definitive. Even if you didn't like his doctor, the sheer scale of the character is incredible. Someone who could scare as much as make us laugh, the perfect ally and the worst enemy. Science fiction is... Science fiction is full of animals. Questionable animatronic cats, intelligent stroke, giant rats galore. There's nothing like a plot involving some mutated common or garden household pet stomping around, causing havoc and destruction wherever it goes, in the best tradition of 1950s B-movies. So, let's forget all that, and instead consider a few classic animals of a far tamer persuasion. 
There was telefantasy before Doctor Who, and believe it or not, Nigel Neal was one of the pioneers in the field of animal husbandry, until they caught him at it one day. The rather slow first episode of the Quatermass Experiment is livened up to no end by the appearance of the wonderfully batty Miss Wilde and her pet cat Henry. She seems commendably unconcerned that a dirty great rocket has just demolished her house, but is unanimous that her pussy gets its fair share of airtime on the BBC News report. But I think we can salute in the story of brave men, a brave little lady. Oh, Henry was brave too. Henry? Yes, my oh, yes, indeed. Uh, uh, Miss Wilde has her cat with her. Uh, he doesn't appear to be at all frightened, does he? No, no, not my Henry. No. <laughs> When the beloved editor of this truly remarkable tape sign announced to the unsuspecting world that Rups, ah, sorry, RPS issue 9 would be on the subject of music, suggestions started rolling in about the music of Dudley, Dick mentions the cello, Simpson, Dominic Schmart braces Glynn, and of course Kev McCullough. All this set me thinking, which is unusual even by my standards that between Dudley and Dominic, there was a gap of five seasons in which that time some of the best ever incidentals were used on Who. The name of this composer is the BBC Radiophonic Workshop, and after 18 years of providing sound effects for the series, they were given a second chance to provide the music score, starting from season 18, and which to my mind was the workshop's best ever set of scores. Incoming producer John Nathan Turner took a big gamble by getting rid of Dudley, although he would have could have taken an even bigger gamble if he had allowed Dudley to carry on with his pathetic rumblings and noises. Peter Howe was the man responsible for the rearrangement of the theme, and the best if you watch Who-related items on Blue Peter and... Here's Paul Chandler clamping down the, on the perversions of 60s Who. Hello. Hello and welcome to uh, the Investigation uh, Bureau for indecent things happening on the television. Yes, uh, we have uh, reason to believe that um, there's been some naughty bits on Doctor Who recently. Well, not recently, in 1968 actually, but, but there has been, so we want to show you them now. We've watched them time and time again. To make sure they're naughty. We think they are. Yes, this is the first one. We think you'll find it very naughty. Well, most of them came out again, but there was something definitely odd about them when they did. Odd? Yes. Old oh, Billy Rutledge, for instance. He was quite cooperative about my investigation to Vaughan initially, but after he'd been to the IE building, he started getting a bit sticky about it. Doctor, would you look at that one? You see? It's terribly naughty. As is this bit coming up now. Yes, that's maybe, yes, this should come in very handy. Call me any time, I'm usually available. Ah, I'd better lay on transport to get you two back to London. That was ever so naughty. Obviously, I realised that listening to this as in the way you do, you can't actually see the pictures, but believe me, they're terribly naughty. Terribly, terribly naughty. Yes, here's another one. <laughs> What's odd about that, then? Well, it has nothing to do with the radio, as far as I can see. Oh, Doctor, just put it back together again. Okay. I suppose Zoe would have left a note, do you? No, I can't see anything. Well, you might at least help me look for it. I suggest we try the wall. Eh? <laughs> but I can't do anything about that. No. But I can, now. You see? It's positively indecent. Yes. <laughs> yes, as I say, you should have seen the pictures, but... Um, <laughs> I did. Many, many, many times. Yes, Doctor, I've got a report here on two girls, about 19 or so. One of them dark, one of them fair. One of them was wearing very distinctive clothes. Sorry, Doctor, that's okay, Just a minute, please. Uh, bring it here. Yes? These clothes, did they include a, a, a rather brightly coloured feather boa? You see? You see? <laughs> Doctor Who had been using as a dating agency. The Brigadier is involved. Yes, I, I think I might go and speak to the Brigadier. <laughs> yes, um, anyway, that's about it for now. I uh, think I'm going to go and watch some more Doctor Who. I heard there's some very, very good bits on uh, uh, Peter Davison episode involving Nicola Bryant, but uh, I won't, uh, yes, well, <laughs> bye. <laughs> well, 
we're running out of time, but I want to ask you a couple, two more things before we yeah, go sure. um, about RPS. What, one of them is that um, what's the story behind the RPS documentary? Uh, I know there was a documentary. I don't know how long it is. I've forgotten, but um, um, Andy's involved. Isn't yes, Andy, Andy, Andy is the RPS documentary. Basically, he he commissioned it himself, and um, I think it was about the time because about ninety five, ninety four, ninety five. Um, he it, it, the writing was on the wall for RPS, and I was writing a lot to Andy. Then I think from from ninety four onwards, we became very regular pen friends until he moved in with he obviously he moved to Salisbury in ninety seven. So we didn't pen friend anymore after he came here. But um, he said, "Oh, you know," because he was doing uh, he was doing uh, the type documentaries on the story, the films we were doing, and he was determined to do an RPS one. And uh, he recorded, he videoed a lot of what we filmed for what we uh, us recording the last issue, and did copious interviews with us. And um, it took a long, 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 long time to put together because that was about ninety five when we did the bulk of the last issue. And I think we did a retrospective one. We did in ninety seven. Andrew Candish and I recorded on location. We actually recorded a. Um, a bit about the Paul McGann movie um, but it Andy was actually living with us at the time he put the video together which was 19 was 2003 it was just before Ali and I got married and um, so we actually did a we recorded a commentary for that actually a very early very primitive commentary but a commentary uh, but yes he, he basically and he, it was brilliantly done and I'm very happy that it's the last word on RPS because it was so well, appropriately done and, and well done and, and had the sort of sound bites of, from episodes complimenting things, and making funny comments. Um, and it's like Andrew Candish is talking about his backing music and they did a clip of Perchy from the Demons saying, fat, not all good, that'll do. <laughs> mm -hmm. he, really, he really meticulously put it together. There was a clip that I saw on Facebook was when when you were recording and Andrew was doing an article, Andrew yeah. Candish was doing an article and, and, and it was all it was going <laughs> a little bit heated. <laughs> well the thing is he we had a perfectly good Jack Lee. We've had one since day one. And he was doing a clip from um City of Death and for some reason he didn't have the Jack Lee then and I was kind of like um, aren't you going to have the Jack Lee then? I'm recording, you know. That. Well, you wouldn't need to whisper if you'd have the Jack Lee. You know, he, he, there were certain things you didn't get. So, yeah, that was actually a good example of the fact that we were, we, we could be a bit heated at times. But it was a good snapshot. He did a great job. And the video came out. I've still got the video. But he has toyed for many years now. Well, I mean, there's so many things he could put out, and we're just patiently waiting for them. Um, he he he's going to do a DVD of of the ultimately somewhere uh, of the RPS documentary. It certainly got my approval. I I like I very much like what he did and approve what he did. Um, and it was an exhaustive project, and I know he's quite proud of it. Um, so it's out there. It's on video at the moment. I've I've got you know obvious various conversions and things like that. But we had to wait for it a long time, and I think we'll mm. have to wait twice as long with the DVD. <laughs> Uh, but no, he, he did a lovely. Um, there was actually one. I, I don't know if they remember, but um, Troby and Lisa did. We're going to do a fifteen uh, in nineteen ninety nine, and we. I think both you and I contributed articles to it. I did a double dunce on Time Monster and Terminus, and I would love to know what happened to the tapes because even if they don't want to put it out, I wouldn't mind having copies of what I did. Mm. Um, and I think other others did. Yeah, I, bet, I sort of, I did sort of remember that. They, yeah, I thought they had done. They want again. It was going to be two issues long, which I thought, no, don't do that. I did that, and it didn't work. Um, and it was going to be all on the theme of cars, I, I, cars named after doctors or something, or sort of the big four <laughs> began or something. It was something weird, and it was very much based on the destiny of the doctors computer game at the time. I could. Oh, well, one thing I will say before we go. Um, I couldn't do an RPS now. I, just as you say, and and Troby and Lisa say, I, I I couldn't devote it entirely to Doctor Who. I've said my piece mm -hmm. as far as RPS go, but 
I think what I would do, I don't think I've got enough enthusiasm to do it, but if I was to do one now, I would call it obvious stun dummy. And because <laughs> that's always makes me laugh in India. And I would just put on all those joyous things that I find joyous about telly and, and it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be specific shows or anything. It, it would just be a celebration of why I love old TV. And, um, the obvious stunt dummy is something that always makes me laugh. Mm. So uh, that's probably what I do now. Um, but no, I, but, um, Andrew Dexter has asked me, well, when is RPS coming back? It's, not, it's never going to come back. Um, there was, the, the, that was the other thing. I lost it very quickly. Well, it's in my mind. Um, about 10 years ago, um, but no, it was actually about eight years ago, um, an RPS turned up on eBay. Mm, and you know, it was, it would, <laughs> I thought to myself, I didn't charge for this in the back in the day. And they've got this really early issue and there they are charging about three quid. And, um, and I, the way it was described made me feel like a, a museum specimen in a cage. Um, you know, so this is how Dr. Who fans used to celebrate. Oh my God. That, that's, you know, that makes me really feel like a, in a glass cage. You know, didn't, sort of. didn't we see one at a Doctor Who convention once yes, as well, did, on, yes. the, on the, uh, the de- our dealer's table? The dealer's table. I, I should have had words with that deal. I think, you know, be, I think people sort of said, Nick, do you want to cause a fun? I, no, I'm just delighted to see it there. I'm surprised it's there. <laughs> you know, we, our production values weren't exactly professional. Um, and it was nice that they keep popping up from time to time. I mean, you know, it, we were very small fry, even for fans. And it was it was just nice that a little bit of immortality leaks through now and then. You know, it was it's nice to see it. <laughs> well, thank you very much. My pleasure. Whilst I think of it, um, I was wondering: Are there any sort of outtakes or f- for behind the scenes memories you have of, of sort of particularly amusing moments that uh, you could share with me? Well, in terms of the outtakes, I think we did a lot of outtakes on RPS Ten was the cutting room floor special, so mm. there was quite a few outtakes that went in there. Um, there was, yeah, I mean, there was there was lots of lovely little silly things. I mean, um, there was one bit. I and mean, the trouble with RPS is we were having so much fun, we put them in. Uh, mm. You know, if, we, if something went wrong, we kind of played up to it rather than kind of went back and re-recorded. Um, but I know that with um, there's Troby recording article about music for RPS 9. And, of course, he, bless him, he used to come along on the Sunday lunch times and he used to bring his lunch which consisted of sandwiches and, and crisps. And there was an empty crisp that halfway through, a, a, a gentle breeze blew the empty crisp packet on the thing. And of course, poor, we were taking the wee-wee out of poor old David Bridge, who was sort of saying, oh, I better stop the wasps come in. And that was the, uh, you know, we, 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 we were kind of got it in as often as we could. Mm. And um, he, he said, oh, I better stop the crisp packets coming to the room. <laughs> and and, kind of, and with things like that. And, um, yeah. And I think we, you know, uh, but, but we, we kind of, we, we, we left, left all the, all the, all the labels untucked as it were. Um, I think there was, we were, uh, we were recording an article, Andrew Candish and I were recording an article and the telly was on and the sound was down. And I think it was the last season of House of Cards and there was Isla Blair getting into bed with somebody and we completely, you know, we're halfway through recording. We got, oh, <laughs> <laughs> we left it on. And, and so most of most of the outtakes can actually be heard on the finished recordings. Um, cause we, we just, it was a bit like Sutton Park in that respect, you know. Kind of we, we sort of if it was we 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 integrated it in somehow. Um, yeah. And also, you know, I um, there was te- there were certain technical things that we played up to. I mean, um, 
I had Linda's old recording a video of um, Armageddon Factor, and I think she she changed the type of recorder she did from episode one, the two to three, and uh, there was there's a sound. I don't know if it's half a scream from Romana or something. It sounds just like an elephant. <laughs> and um, and I, I remember, this, you know, this must have been absolutely unintelligible to somebody else. But um, I said, have anybody else got an elephant on their arm again? In fact, you know, because I, I actually ran the clip and mm -hmm. it, uh, it came, reminded me, oh, no. <laughs> 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 oh, it, 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 anybody else got an elephant on their arm again? In fact, you know? <laughs> so um, we, we very much um, <coughs> like to that, that thing. And I think they're all in there. I, think I don't think there's anything. That, that we 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 cocked out that wasn't left in. So, um, but then we had a relaxed atmosphere, and that's why, that's why I think we lasted for so long was because people were happy with that, and we were happy with that. And um, it was we had the written article. I think the trouble is with um, when we did that, we came to do fourteen. Um, they tried. We we we. It was spontaneous, entirely spontaneous, and I think. The interruptions and things like that we that Trovi and Lisa tried to get in didn't quite work because they were too forced. It was very much we weren't planning on sort of putting those things in. You know, it was some, you know if there was more than one of us in the same room. And actually, um, Alan Hayes has said to to me that he rather envies the way we put RPS together because it was more of a team effort, whereas he would sort of um, commission articles right from his pen friends and right across the whole. Uh, country, and I thought to myself, "Well, you didn't do too badly." You know, you had the, you know some good quality articles. Uh, one of his contributors, Mark Matthew Sweet, is now a famous journalist. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but no, uh, yeah, it, it was just one big laugh. I think I, 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 we just, I think it was, we just had a complete gas with it, um, mm -hmm. and um, and it all stayed in. I think most of it. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Pleasure. This show is part of the Pride 48 Network. Find more shows over at pride48.com. Oh dear, <laughs> what's going on now? Oh, it's the Shy Life Podcast. Let's go. I have a voice. I have a voice. You have a voice. You have a voice. We have a voice. We have a voice. Unique voices in podcasting. Univospods.net. You're more confident with asking people. You know, I've still got that thing where I think it's someone's going to tell me off if I, uh, or, or they're going to say they don't want to do it, and I'll be upset. So, so I know sometimes you you be my the person who's kind of. Um, Oh, you go, you know, I, I'd be just like, you know, if somebody came out of the blue and said, I wanted to talk about something you did 20 years ago, you know, I'd, I'd jump at the chance. Um, so sometimes I, it does take me a while to get back. I mean, I've been meaning to ask Kerry to be on the show for quite a long time, but I don't see him that often. So sometimes it yeah. doesn't feel sort of a, a, appropriate to, to sort of bring it up. But yeah, I think, yeah. sometimes but it, it, it just takes a little something that happens to boost mm -hmm. your confidence. So someone gets in touch. Yes. And they think, oh, you know, they remember that, or they like it, or you know, like I recently in the last week, my head mistress from infant school died, and I put, I deliberately put a long and mm. uh, kind of reminiscent uh, status up on Facebook, and it's got, it's really got a conversation started. And mm. I, you were saying about confidence, I, I'm not actually sure I am because I would love, absolutely love to gather all these people together and obviously in the circumstances it's not possible to meet but i would love to do a a, a, a zoom chat recorded zoom chat and talk about all, all our memories of 45 years ago or something and um because it's still you know i've got the memories there i'd love to just put it out there similarly um my mum's cousin is out there and i i wanted to meet up with her this year and the covid's prevented it and i would uh, and my and my other mum's more distant cousin who got in touch with her 
um, I think, oh, yeah, I would love to do some recording. Um, and similarly, um, I'm going to be taking my video camera to Wales and I'm going to be filming. Well, they don't know this yet. It's going to be a surprise. But um, I want to kind of film there them talking about my niece and great niece and my sister and brother in law. Because well, I mean, if you seeing. can get if you can get your sister talking about something, uh, you, you're you're on a um, uh, a free a free pass to you know get 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 your your sister to talk for the podcast if she were because you recently sent me some more stuff with your mum. We we could always do an episode yeah. with your mum's recordings. I would be absolutely delighted if you could loop in her. I mean, she, I reckon she'd be up for it. But the thing is, I mean, uh, the thing is, we will be talking at length this week. Uh, when I'm over there, I'm consuming lots of wine, and and <laughs> I can, I, I I I could drop it into the conversation that you know there's an awful lot of stuff being recorded at the moment, and and it's terribly valuable historically, and um, I'm, I I kind of I want to get or well, I want to record them both or both sets of family talking about COVID and mm. how they've coped and over the last, and it's just an excuse really to kind of put it in historical perspective this year but to get them committed to film um and to video should i say um because as i discovered having lost both my parents you know they're not with you for some time and you really cherish what you've recorded and, and done i mean similarly you must feel like about auntie jesse who's on the title sequence of um, <laughs> yes. uh, of, of uh, shy yeah what a lovely idea what a lovely tri- what a lovely tribute uh, uh, I was thinking, uh, uh, um, she, she she sort of did her own little, without realising it, she did her own little RPS article um, back when they were showing Genesis of the Daleks and she walked yeah. in when Davros was on the screen and she went, oh, what a horrible man. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it made you did, did you record that? I, no, I'm not sure I did, but, but oh, it, 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 did, it did put into my, my you know, when, when, when people who, it, you know, they sort of said, like, Oh, Freddy Krueger! He, you know, you get used to seeing Freddy Krueger. He stops being scary, but you forget that some people haven't seen Freddy Krueger yeah. or they haven't seen Davros, and they walk in, yeah. and if they're of an older, if they're older, that, yeah. that there is a power that, that you know, yeah. if we're used to seeing Davros. So what sort of thing? But there are people. Who, I, know, if anything, I had Davros the other way round, and <laughs> I, I, I first saw Davros when I was six, when Genesis went out, and um, I. My childlike mind, sensitive though it was, um, assumed because it was the the key was his the, the wheelchair. I, because it was done like a Dalek, I assumed that if you took off a Dalek, that's what the Daleks looked like inside. They were aliens. They were different. They were. The, I I didn't realise he was a sort of injured human. I I just assumed he was like this. What you got if you picked out a Dalek. Um, six months later Planet of Evil went out and there was a very similar face on the dead bodies you know those shriveled bodies and I was horrified because these people were human you'd seen them as human and now they were shriveled bodies Mm. that's when I who started streaking me out when they were actually meant to be humans you know and and they were were now shriveled bodies that's what freaked me out um, Davros didn't freak me out because I didn't think he was human to start with. You know, I didn't realise he was supposed to be humanoid originally. Um, and so I cheerfully watched Genesis without being frightened. But Planet of Evil was different because mm. you actually saw them, sure. I kind of... Yeah. Um, and it's different. I think the body horror of Hinchcliffe was what got me. Um, I mean, I, you know, I, I huge respect for the stories and I, I, lo- I love watch, re-watching them they, they can they bear re-watching over and over again but it was that that thing that the body horror did bother me uh, at the age of six or seven He ain't all that shy. No. 
<laughs> I don't know. Them. Boy, I hope Nick Goodman is on this episode. <laughs> This is just the weirdest thing I've ever heard.